Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. God has awakened us to another bright new day with all its opportunities for pleasing Him. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. begins with our opening sentence on page 34 and continues on page 35 and following in our books of common prayer. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Hear us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. We will exalt you, O God, our Savior, and praise your name forever and ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your Spirit, May we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. The Venite. Oh, come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it, his hands molded dry land. Come let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he himself is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. If only you would hear his voice today, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We are in God's presence this morning, mindful that we have not always been the people that God has called us to be. We have fallen, fallen short by our sin. Let us therefore ask for God's forgiveness as we bring before God those things of which our consciences are afraid. Let us pray. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. And we continue with the Psalms appointed for this morning. They're Psalms 40, beginning on page 519, and 54, beginning on page 536. Let us recite the Psalms sequentially. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He stooped to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the desolate pit, out of the mire and clay. He set my feet upon a high cliff and made my foot in show. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe, put their trust in the Lord. Happy are they who trust the Lord. They do not resort to evil spirits or turn to false gods. Great things are they that you have done, O Lord my God. How great your wonders and your plans for us. There is none who can be compared with you. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them. But they are more than I can count. In sacrifice and offering you take no pleasure. You have given me ears to hear you. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And so I said, Behold, I come. In the rule of the book it is written concerning me, I love to do your will. O oh my God, your law is deep in my heart. I proclaim righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I did not restrain my lips, and that, O oh Lord, you know. Your righteousness have I not hidden in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your deliverance. I have not concealed your love and faithfulness from the great congregation. You are the Lord. Do not withhold your compassion for me. Let your love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. For innumerable troubles have crowded upon me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more in number than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and altogether dismayed who seek after my life to destroy it. Let them draw back and be disgraced who take pleasure in my misfortune. Let those who say, Aha, and gloat over me be confounded because they are ashamed. Let all who seek you rejoice in you and be glad. Let those who love your salvation continually say, Great is the Lord. Though I am poor and afflicted, the Lord will have regard for me. You are my helper and my deliverer. Do not tarry, O oh my God. Psalm 54. Save me, O oh God, by your name. In your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For the arrogant have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life. Those who have no regard for God. Behold, God is my helper. It is the Lord who sustains my life. Render evil to those who spy on me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will offer you a free will sacrifice. And praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from every trouble, and my eye has seen the ruin of my foes. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We come to our first lesson, which is, which is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34 verses 18 to 35. You shall keep the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. All that first opens the womb is mine. All your male livestock, all your male livestock, and the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, 
you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. No one shall appear before me empty-handed. For six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest even in plowing time and in harvest time you shall rest. You shall observe the festival of weeks, the first fruit of wheat harvest, and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall cover your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, and the sacrifice of the festival of the Passover shall not be left until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. The Lord said to Moses, Write these words in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. He was there with the Lord for forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, where the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the end of the reading. And we continue with the canticle Jesus Savior on page 52 of our Books of Common Prayer. Jesus Savior of the world, come to us in your mercy. We look to you to save and help us. By your cross and your life laid down, you set your people free. We look to you to save and help us. When they were ready to perish, you saved your disciples. We look to you to come to our help. In the greatness of your mercy, loose us from our chains. Forgive the sins of all your people. Make yourself known as our savior and mighty deliverer. Save and help us that we may praise you. Come now and dwell with us, Lord Christ Jesus. Hear our prayer and be with us always. And when you come in your glory, make us to be one with you and to share the life of your kingdom. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We come now to our second reading from the Gospel of Matthew. We read in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 37. Jesus continued, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to, to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. 
It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the end of the reading. Thanks be to God. So now let us reflect on this passage that we have just read from the Gospel of Matthew. We have read from chapter 5, verses 27 to 37. And remember Jesus is continuing his teaching. He's teaching on the law. And remember Jesus is trying to explain the full meaning of the law. Not just the surf superficial meaning or the surface meaning. but to explain the law in its fullness and the various aspects of the law. When we say the law, we refer to you know, the Ten Commandments and all the laws that God gave to Moses that his people, the Israelites, must live out to be faithful to him. And Jesus is saying that, remember, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So for obeying God's laws makes one right with God. So you, you become righteous if you do your best to obey God's law, with God's help, of course. But you must understand the law. You must understand the fullness of the law. You mustn't have just a superficial understanding of what the law is about. You must understand all the implications of the law and all the ways in which, um, if you don't understand fully, you can actually transgress the law and therefore you're not right with God your righteousness is is at a, at, a, at a superficial level it is not at the level it ought to be Jesus is saying that the Pharisees and the scribes they have been teaching the law at the superficial level they have not been able to explain the fullness of the law so people understand and therefore be able to keep the law properly and, and, and therefore be right with God live righteous lives so Jesus is continuing to explain the law. Last time we, we talked about murder in particular. Let's say the main one we talked about. And today Jesus is continuing to talk about adultery and divorce and, and swearing, making, swearing an oath. 
So adultery, Jesus says, yes. You know, the commandments that God gave to Moses, number seven says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And that, therefore, it follows adultery is, is a sin against God because God has consecrated in marriage a man and a woman, right? In this holy union, God has set them apart to do his work, to multiply, you know, and to serve him in, in, in the community as part of his community of, of people doing God's work. So he has set them apart for this sexual union by which they'll produce children, go and multiply, you know, is part of the mandate given to husband and wife. So God consecrates them, a particular man and woman for that purpose in marriage. Set them apart, holy, you know, makes them holy in that sense. So when one or the other goes outside of the marriage, and Jesus says, says when a man looks at, well, we come to that. When one or the other goes outside of the marriage for sexual intercourse, then they're, they're sort of breaking that very holy union that God has set them apart for. And so they're transgression, transgressing. They're sinning against God. And Jesus is saying, nice, the, the commandments make that very clear, the actual act of a married, one married person going outside of the marriage and sexual, for, sex, for sexual intercourse. But Jesus is saying, yes, the Pharisees, that's very clear. But I say to you, in the fullness of the law, if even in your, a man or a woman who is married to one person, even in their minds, look at another person with lust in their, with lust, then they are thereby committing adultery. Jesus is expanding, you know, or showing the fullness of this law concerning adultery. It is not limited to the actual act, but it, it begins when we, through our eyes, lust. And one married person, through his or her eyes, looks lustfully at another. They are, in fact, committing that act in their heart. And Jesus is saying that we cannot consider that we are you know, innocent. We are guilty as well of, of adultery when that is done. And Jesus is saying because while we are not committing the act, we are in fact crossing the line in terms of that consecrated union between, our, between the parties, husband and wife, the one who is looking lustfully at another is in their hearts, in their hearts crossing that line, which binds them into that holy union with the one who is the spouse. And so Jesus is again um, showing the full, you know, the fullness of that law. And we, are, we do well, of course, to understand that. What Jesus is saying, of course, is that it's a short, you know, it doesn't take much to, to go now from that, from that you know, lustful looking. It doesn't take much more for us to actually get ourselves into the act of adultery. And Jesus is saying, um, in a very colorful way, that whatever, applying it, we can apply it particularly, what he's saying, particularly to adultery. Whatever situations we might be finding ourselves in, that will lead us into lustfulness, then we should avoid those situations. In general, if we generalize, Jesus is saying, whatever will lead us into sin, whatever, if our, arm, if our hand is leading us into sin, we should cut it off. It's not a literal thing, of course, but whatever it is, whatever activity, whatever place, you know, whatever it is, whatever habits we might have, whatever places we might go, whatever, whatever things we might look at, and in this day and age we have all kinds of things. There's a lot of pornography and so on, for example, on, on the internet. But any kind of activity that will lead us into sin, or whatever kind, adultery and other kinds, whatever will lead us into sin, we should make sure that we remove that from our or, or a list of activities so that we will not be drawn into sin. 
Jesus goes on to talk about divorce. You know, people were permitted, Mo Moses in fact permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce for his wife. But Moses, as we, if we go back to Jesus' um, discussion elsewhere, Moses only allowed that because men were divorcing their wives you know, for the flimsiest of excuses. So, and then a wife who is divorced from, from a husband um, and doesn't have the certificate is really, you know, in the society has no, no future, you know, as, uh, you know, a very dim future indeed, you know. So that's why Moses, Jesus is saying, Moses allowed a certificate of divorce for the protection of the woman. But in fact, Jesus says, any party that divorces, if a man divorces his wife, then he puts his wife into a situation where she will be committing adultery, and he himself will be committing adultery. So Jesus is saying, anyone who divorces his wife, except on gongs of, uh, of an and chastity, the one gong, causes her to commit adultery. And of course, um, the man himself would commit adultery. So Jesus is saying, again, divorce. He's warning against divorce. And divorce leads to sin, indeed, because by divorcing the divorcees, let's put it that way, indeed, by marrying others, will be, or not marrying others and engaging in sexual activity, will indeed be committing adultery. And Jesus goes on again in this last part of the teaching, in the last part of the teaching, to talk about swearing. Jesus says, you know, if we want, if we have to do something, we, we make a commitment, let our word be our commitment. Because as he says here, you know, people like to swear, certainly in his time, swear by this or by that or by the other but he says if you swear by heaven this heaven is not yours heaven is the throne of god if you swear by earth earth is not yours it is god's footstool and jerusalem is not yours it is the city of god your own head if you swear by your own head it's not it's not really yours so really there's no basis for swearing on anything just indeed when you want to make a commitment make an honest commitment. There's no need indeed. And so we have a lot to think about here um, as we reflect on this passage this morning. The Lord be with you. Continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue in prayer. Into your hands, Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us to its close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good work we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit that we may seek in everything to know your will and knowing it may gladly perform it to the honor and glory of your name 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we reach in forth our hands in love, and bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. And we continue in prayer. We thank God for the gift of life that he's renewed in us this day. And we pray for God's world and for God's people everywhere. In particular, we pray for those places where there is war and fighting and strife and oppression and sickness and disease and all those things that oppress humankind. You think of countries like the Ukraine, the Sudan, Yemen, and other parts of the world where there continues to be, to be fighting. In places where there are oppressive governments, where people are living under very you know, harsh regimes. You think of places where People have died from natural disasters, from disease, particularly this COVID-19, which is still taking lives. Father, we pray for peace in your world, for relief from oppression, and for recovery from illness, for an end to all that the sickness and disease that plague this world. Today, Lord, we Pray for your church worldwide, for all the ministers, Lord, of your word and of your sacraments. In our own church, the Anglican Church worldwide, we pray for the Most Reverend Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury. In our church in the province of the West Indies, we pray for the Most Reverend Howard Gregory, Archbishop of the Church in the province of the West Indies and Bishop of Jamaica. For all our bishops, of the various dioceses in our province, we lift them up this morning into your grace, your love, your inspiration, and your care. We pray especially for Claude, our bishop of the church in the diocese, of the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. Pray your blessings upon him at this time, Lord, that you will give him courage and strength in, in this time of trial. Pray for his wife for continued healing, for his family as they come to terms with the loss of their mother. We pray as well in our diocese for the family of Father Louis Belgrave, who passed away as whose funeral was yesterday. We pray for all our clergy, retired clergy, particularly those who are ill at this time, and we ask your healing hand upon them. For all the active clergy in the parishes, Lord, we pray you continue to be with them, to guide them, to inspire their work as they seek to lead your people to stand, Lord, and in, in in stand for you in, in the communities in which we live, to be sources of your help and hope and love. Continue to strengthen us in the work that we do. And we pray for the entire Christian church in this country of ours, for unity among our leaders and among our people as we seek to make your name known in this land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for those in authority among us, our prime minister, our president, members of parliament, members of cabinet, decision makers in the public and private spheres. We pray for decisions that are made in the best interest of all rather than for partisan interests. We pray for our people mindful, Lord, that we are in this place together, put here, Lord, that we might work together to make this land of ours one that is a land of peace, a productive land where there is equality and where there is love among our people. So, Father, we pray for all that has gone amiss in this land of ours, for those who have taken to crime, for victims of crime, for those who have suffered 
loss through crime, those who mourn the loss of their loved ones, for the sick and suffering who are crying out for relief and for healing and for care, for young people who are being led astray, Lord, so that they squander their God-given potential. For all that is amiss in this land, we pray for your hand, Lord, that you would help us to put right what has gone amiss. For those in all kinds of need, Lord, we lift them up this morning. We pray for your people in this land. Give us eyes that we might see, Lord. And give us hearts that will be moved to do the best we can to bring relief and to represent you, Lord, in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue with the prayer of dedication. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.